Good afternoon. Before we start talking about viral genomes, I want to pick up from last time. I want to show you a, an example of two of the assays that we talked about last time used on the new coronavirus uh, in China. So a paper was published. Well, actually, this is in BioArchive, which is a preprint server. Now we can put our manuscripts up here bef before and during the submission process so everyone can see them. This is fabulous. So this is downloaded from the BioArchive server. You can see the link down there in the lower right. Discovery of a novel coronavirus associated with the recent pneumonia outbreak in humans, potential bat origin. Here are the authors. This is from a laboratory in Wuhan. And what they did, uh, you remember last time we talked about how they were doing uh, lung washes, bronchial alveolar lavage. You put a tube into the lung, you put a little liquid in, then you take it out. So they took some of that from one patient and they added it to cells. We have to turn the lights off because you need to see this. They add it to cells. These are Vero cells. A Vero cell is a, a vervet monkey kidney cell. Right? They use those. And they also use the human cell line, but this is the Vero cell result. So they took monolayers of these cells. They remove the medium, and they add a little bit of this bronchioalveolar lavage from one patient. Very precious material, right? They let the virus, they let the sample absorb. They don't know if there's any virus in it. And then they put medium on, and then uh, 24 hours later, they look in the microscope. So on the left is the mock-infected monolayer. You always need a mock-infected monolayer. You just put some PBS on it just to make sure that things are not dying in your lab. And then on the left, that's the mock-infected monolayer. 24 hours later, you see it's beautiful, nice intact cells. And on the right is the monolayer where they put on the fluid from the patient. And what do we see? Cytopathic effects. You see, what I tell you is real. <laughs> it's not fake, because <laughs> other people use the same terms and they use the same methodology. So a day later, you look under the scope, and can you imagine when they saw this, how excited they were? We have something causing CPE, which is probably a virus. Uh, and then they went on to characterize it. So that's one use of CPE. That's what I said. You can use it to see if you've got a new virus. Luckily, this virus causes CPE. Of course, there are many that don't. But if you have a virus that doesn't cause CPE, you can do something else. The other thing they did, they had antibodies against other coronaviruses because people have been studying them for many years. They took some of those antibodies, which are directed against a protein that is widely conserved among different coronaviruses, and they took a replicate of this monolayer, added the antibodies to the cells. Usually, you have to permeabilize the cells with like methanol to let the antibodies get in, and then you let the antibodies stick for a while, and then you add a second antibody with some kind of color indicator. And then that's what they see here on the left. So on, on the next slide, this on the left is the monolayer without any antibody. It's infected. You can see a little bit of CPE there. And on the right, they've added an antibody uh, using, see, cross-reactive viral NP antibody. NP is a viral protein. They happen to have an antibody against it. And you see red fluorescence. And so they are using a second detector antibody that has a red that will fluoresce red under UV light. And so you can see now that there's viral protein being made in these cells. So another one of those assays we talked about last time using serology to study uh, viruses. So that's a really nice real-time example of using these techniques. That's what they first did to solve what was infecting these individuals. And of course, they went on to sequence the genome. In that paper, they have that as well. So as I said, I'm going to try and find things that are going on with this new virus that are related to what we talk about in class here to make it more relevant for you. Okay, today I want to talk about viral genomes. I want to go through all the different types there are. There, there are a number. Different from us, we have one type of genome. We have a double-stranded DNA genome, but viruses have all different kinds. I want to talk about all the different kinds and what they do and how we study them, how we use genetics to study them. And there was a big breakthrough in the 1950s in virology. Remember, 
We identify viruses around 1900. People start to study them. In the 1950s, cell culture is finally developed. And then in the 1950s, we find out from experiments I'm going to show you now that the viral nucleic acid is the genetic code. I have to say, for many years, people didn't think nucleic acid did anything. They thought proteins specified the genetic code for many reasons. One of them was there were only four bases in DNA. And they said, how could four bases code for anything? And so slowly data emerged saying that DNA was the genetic code. A big experiment, 1944, Avery, McLeod, and McCarty working at Rockefeller showed that you could take DNA from one bacterium, put it into another, and transfer, transfer the properties of that first bacterium. They called it transformation. We still use that word today when we put DNA into cells. So that was the first evidence. Uh, of course, in 1953, the structure of DNA was solved. And that was important in understanding how it could be a template for genetic information. But in the 1950s, experiments with a DNA and an RNA virus proved that in viruses, nucleic acid is the genetic information. Tobacco mosaic virus had been crystallized in 1935. And the, the person who did it, Wendell Stanley, he thought viruses were infectious proteins because 95% of his purified virus was protein. 5% of it was phosphate, but he ignored it. He thought it was a contaminant. Of course, the phosphate is part of the RNA, which we now know to be important. He got the Nobel Prize for crystallizing TMV, even though he was wrong about <laughs> the protein being infectious. So that's TMV on the right here, an electron micrograph. And I'll show you an experiment done by Frankel Conrad showing that the RNA of TMV is the genetic material. And on the left, uh, the Hershey Chase experiment with a bacteriophage called T4, which is a DNA virus, showing that DNA is the genetic material. The one on the left you probably heard about in high school. I know high school teachers teach this. Uh, if not, you've heard it sometime here in college. And if not, well, this will be the first time you hear it. This is the famous kitchen blender experiment, where these two individuals, Hershey, Al Hershey was the investigator, Martha Chase, his assistant in 1952. Uh, here is the blender. You can't see it very well. I took a picture of it. It's at Cold Spring Harbor, which is where he worked, out on Long Island. And there's a library with a glass case and behind the glass. Oh, there's the blender at the top there. Uh, they have one of his blenders. So if you're ever out there, go to the library and check it out. It's pretty cool. Uh, and he used the blender in this experiment. What he did was he said, OK, what's What's the genetic material, the protein or the DNA of this virus? So he took uh, the phage and he labeled the viral protein with radioactive sulfur by growing the phage in the presence of radioactive sulfur. And then he added the phage to bacteria for just five minutes so that the phage would attach. And then he put the mixture in a blender to shear off the phages. So that's where the blender comes in. Uh, and then, so, so he's shearing off the phage and presumably the nucleic acid is getting in. And then he lets the, the bacteria incubate. And he says in the progeny phages, do I find radioactivity? And he didn't find any when he used radioactive sulfur to label the protein. So he said, oh, protein must not be the genetic material. In a separate experiment, he, he labeled the viral DNA with radioactive phosphorus, which is, of course, part of the nucleic acid, in this case, the DNA. Again, experiment adsorbed the virus shear it off in the blender, and the progeny phages, you can find radioactive DNA, proving that uh, DNA is the genetic material. Now, two comments about this experiment. First, the idea of putting radioactivity in a blender scares the hell out of me, but nobody used to care. People were pretty lax about safety in the old days. <laughs> well, nowadays, we don't use much radioactivity. That's fine. The other is that we now know that there are phages of E. coli. Not too many, but there are some where the phage actually gets into the cell, the whole phage. So that would have confused this experiment, right? You wouldn't have had a clear-cut answer. He happened to work with T4 where 
The phage rests on the cell and injects the DNA into the bacterium. That was a good choice. He didn't know it at the time, but in retrospect. But often in retrospect, decisions look good like this. All right, that's the Hershey Chase DNA, at least in T4 genetic material. This reinforces the growing idea that DNA can be the genetic material. And then we have a, a very interesting experiment on, on uh, tobacco mosaic virus done by Frankel and Conrad. He had two different strains of tobacco mosaic virus, which I represent here as green and red. He could distinguish the coat proteins. The way these viruses are built, and we'll talk about this more on Monday, the RNA molecule is here. It's shown as a coil. And there are individual proteins, these little outlined guys here, that bind to each other and to the RNA and form a helix. So they protect the RNA and cover it. And that's the virus particle. So he had a way of distinguishing the proteins from his two different strains of tobacco mosaic virus. So what he did is he disassembled these two different viruses. So he got protein and RNA separately. He purified them. And then he took um, the green RNA and mixed it with red proteins to give a hybrid particle. So he had found out early on that if you purified RNA and protein and then mixed them back together, they would reassemble and form a virus particle. Very useful finding. So he mixed the proteins with the RNA, green RNA with red protein, uh, red RNA with green protein, and then he used them to infect tobacco leaves. <laughs> he let the infection go and he harvested what came out. And he found that when you used a green RNA, you got green proteins. Even though you assembled the green RNA with the red protein, what came out is a green, entirely green virus. So the RNA specifies the protein. RNA is the genetic material. And the same with the other, the red RNA complex with the green protein in the end gives rise to red viruses. So two really important experiments showing that nucleic acid is the genetic material. Now, of course, we have no doubt about this, but it's funny to look back and see that people were really not sure about this. So nucleic acid is the genetic material. However, as we have studied viruses, you know, we found all sorts of viruses, billions and billions and billions of them. Nevertheless, even though there's so many, we can actually narrow it down. We can put them in seven different groups. And that's what I want to tell you about for a little bit now, because I think this is a very powerful rubric for organizing the genome. Just remember the number seven train. If I ever ask you how many different kinds of viral genome are there, the answer is seven. Very simple. And let's go through this and, and why. The reason, one of the reasons behind this is that all viruses or viral genomes have to make messenger RNA that can be translated by the host translation system, right? Because viruses do not encode a translation system of their own. So they have to make an mRNA that's compatible. Therefore, uh, this, and this is a hard, fast rule. Nobody's found an exception. No virus encodes a complete translation system. So they all have to make mRNA that the cell can translate. So this gives you a common theme among all viruses that you can use to make the rubric that I want to show you to help you organize these seven different kinds of genomes. So that's a ribosome, by the way. It's not a turkey. Some people think it's a turkey every year. It's not. Next time Thanksgiving comes along, you're eating turkeys, not ribosomes. So this is what I call the Baltimore scheme. In my uh, admiration of things on Earth, we have viruses, we have next plaque assays, and then we have the Baltimore scheme. Like, this is amazing, and I'm going to convince you of that. It is made by a fellow named David Baltimore who's here, and I did my postdoc with him. So I have great respect for him, and he's a great scientist, and he devised this in the 1970s as a way to think about virus genomes. And what he said was every virus needs to make mRNA. So let's put this in the center, put mRNA in the center, and then just see how different viruses get to it. And when he did that, he, put, he could put them into seven different classes. And so they're all here uh, on the outside of the, the, the class numbers, starting with one, 
So one is double-stranded DNA from which mRNA can be made. Another, number two is single-stranded DNA from which double-stranded DNA and then mRNA is made. A few things you have to remember here that are very important. DNA, to make RNA, mRNA from DNA, it has to be double-stranded, always. Single-stranded DNA is not a template for mRNA synthesis or for transcription, the same thing. So if you have a single-stranded DNA genome, it has to first go to double-stranded DNA before you can make mRNA. Then class three is here, double-stranded RNA. That is both a messenger RNA and the anti-messenger RNA strand. And interestingly, that, that mRNA strand in the duplex cannot be translated because it's blocked by the other strand. So you have to actually make mRNA from a double-stranded RNA. Then we have group four, where we have a genome, which we call plus RNA. We'll, we'll talk about some definitions in a moment. And that can, in some cases, be translated directly. But to make more of it, you would go through a minus RNA. We have class five, which is minus RNA. It cannot be translated. It's the opposite sense of mRNA, so it has to be copied. And class six is up here, an unusual class of viruses where the virus particle contains mRNA or plus RNA. And it's copied to DNA, which is made double-stranded. And from the DNA, mRNA is made. What's on the outside here, all these classes, are what's in the virus particle. And finally, class seven, which didn't, we didn't know about at the time when Baltimore made his scheme, consists of gapped double-stranded DNA. This is exemplified by hepatinoviruses or hepatitis B viruses, which we'll talk about. And this is a different because a gapped DNA cannot be transcribed. It has to be repaired first into double-stranded DNA. And then from that, you make mRNA. And so that's the classification scheme, the Baltimore scheme. Now, a couple of definitions before I talk about this some more are very important. So mRNA, of course, is what is translated by ribosomes. And we call that the plus strand, just by convention. It has nothing to do with electrical charge or anything. It's just at one point years ago, someone said, let's say that mRNA is the plus strand, and we're stuck with that. All right, mRNA is the plus strand. And so DNA of the same polarity, in a, say, double-stranded DNA, would be the plus strand of DNA. But of course, if you want to make mRNA from double-stranded DNA, you have to copy the minus strand to make the plus strand, all right? And the RNA and DNA complements of plus strands are called minus strands. Just the complement, again, has nothing to do with charge, negative strands. And that's what I'll be using to talk about these, plus and minus. So when I say plus, it means the same polarity as mRNA, and minus is the complement. Now, when I say plus, I don't always mean mRNA, because as you will see, not all plus RNA is actually translated. We'll get into that in a bit. But the plus simply means it's the same polarity as mRNA. Whether or not it's translated is another step. Okay, so that is the Baltimore scheme. And that's the terminology to explain all the pluses and minuses here. So for example, RNAs of plus polarity could in principle be mRNAs. Minus is the opposite strand. And of course, double-stranded DNA is plus minus. Double-stranded RNA is plus minus. OK? So that's the Baltimore scheme. The beauty of it is that if I tell you a viral genome, you can trace the basic steps that are needed to make mRNA. I can throw out any of these seven classes to you. And if you understand this classification system, you will know how to get to the center, which is mRNA. So for example, if I say, how do you get mRNA from double-stranded DNA? You know that, or you, this is something you have to memorize, I suppose. You memorize that double-stranded DNA can be transcribed to make mRNA. That's the process of making mRNA, right? Transcription. You can make that from double-stranded DNA. So if I say, what about a single-stranded DNA virus? And we have those. You have to remember that single-stranded DNA is not a template for transcription. It has to first be made double-stranded. Only double-stranded DNA among the DNA viruses is a template for transcription. 
neither single-stranded DNA nor gapped double-stranded DNA can be transcribed. They have to be repaired. Minus RNA is not a translation template because it's the wrong polarity. There's no open reading frame to be translated. Only plus mRNA can be translated. But again, not all plus uh, RNA is mRNA. Uh, and finally, a double-stranded RNA. Even though there's a plus strand in the duplex of double-stranded RNA, ribosomes cannot access it. That's something you have to remember. And so to make mRNA from a double-stranded RNA virus, you actually have to copy the minus strand and make a separate plus strand. It seems like a waste, but that's the way it is because double-stranded RNA cannot be translated by ribosomes. So that's the Baltimore system. We have seven classes of viral genomes, double-stranded DNA, gapped double-stranded DNA, and single-stranded DNA. Those are the DNAs, that what we call the DNA viruses. So when I say for the rest of this class, the DNA virus means it has a genome of one of those three types. And then among the RNA viruses, a little more diverse, we have double-stranded RNA, and then three classes of single-stranded RNA, plus, minus, and then plus with a DNA intermediate. It's an extra version of the plus class. And these are all distinct classes with different pathways to mRNA. So it's really straightforward. Uh, you, you know, the, the, the single-stranded DNA, as you'll see, is actually either plus or minus. Both get packaged into the virus particles. It doesn't matter. So that's so why we don't have an extra class of single-stranded DNA viruses. So let's see how that resonates with you. The first question is, why is mRNA placed at the center? Because all virus particles have mRNA. No reason, because all genomes are mRNAs, because mRNA must be made from all genomes, or because Baltimore studied mRNA. OK, looks like we've saturated what we have here. 92% of you got the right answer because mRNA must be made from all viral genomes. <clears throat> That's the reason. Not All virus particles do not contain mRNA. That's what the Baltimore scheme tells us. What is on the outside, those classes, that's what's in the viral particle. Double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, et cetera. So if a virus has double-stranded DNA and it can't have mRNA, and all viral genomes are mRNAs for the same reasons they are not. Now, even though there are only seven classes, structurally viral nucleic acids are pretty diverse. And you can see just a, a list of him, them here that you're going to encounter. And these are the icons I use for them in all of my slides. So they can be linear or circular. So either DNA or RNA could be linear or circular. We have here at the top a double-stranded linear DNA. We have a double-stranded circular DNA. We even have circular RNAs, as you'll see. Genomes can be segmented in pieces. That means a virus particle would have more than one piece of nucleic acid. So the influenza virus genome is eight pieces of RNA, single-stranded minus strands RNA. It could be gapped, as we said, Single-stranded plus or minus can be ambisense, which means it has components of both plus and minus, as we'll see today. It can be double-stranded. It can have proteins attached to it. The ends can be covalently linked. So if you have a double-stranded DNA, this one in the middle here, uh, say, labeled double-stranded, the, there are five and three prime ends. It's a chemical designation for having a free end on the base. Sometimes they can be covalently linked. So the five prime end can be linked through a bond to the three prime end, and that gives you this circular end, which happens for some viruses. And sometimes there's also, besides a protein linked to genomes, there's RNA. So all different configurations. But what that means, we'll see as we talk about how these viruses replicate. But the main point is they all fall into seven classes. No matter what the configuration is of this genome, you can put them in one of those seven classes. And as I said, to this day, I don't know of any other configuration. It might be that it's out there somewhere. 
and an interesting exercise is to think of what other genome configurations might there be, but we haven't found it yet. So first of all, let's, let's look at a little bit about these genomes and what they do. So why are there seven classes? And even beyond that, where, why do we have all these different configurations? As I said the other day, it's hard to answer why questions. So I would put it a different way. Uh, what's the function of genome diversity? And I can answer a little bit of that question, but not all of it. And the first part I can answer is why do we have viruses with both DNA and RNA-based genomes? Because you know everything else on the planet is DNA-based, as far as we know. There are no organisms with RNA genomes. Why are there viruses? Or what's the function of that? Well, I can tell you that the way we think life evolved on this planet is that many billions of years ago, probably, there was an RNA world first where organisms were based on RNA, not DNA. And these were very rather simple organisms. They initially started as just self-replicating molecules of RNA in the, uh, the, the waters of the Earth, the initial Earth. And people now today study this. They can get certain kinds of RNA molecules to copy themselves and reproduce. So we think the early Earth had these. Eventually, they, become, they became maybe simple cells. But there's only so much you can do with RNA because it's not very long, as you'll see in a moment. RNA genomes are not long. So our, base, our genome is 3.2 billion base pairs. You could never have an RNA that long. And so that's, we think that at some point, uh, these RNA genomes switch to DNA. And we think that happened by the production of a protein called reverse transcriptase. We'll, we'll talk about that later, which exists to this day. Now, once you have a G DNA genome, you can have bigger organisms because they can get very large. DNA is more stable and so forth. So we think that was the driving force for the evolution of DNA. It probably evo uh, arose randomly initially, the DNA, but then it had an advantage and so it persisted. But yet today, the RNA viruses are kind of a relic of this RNA world. And in them, we can see signs of an RNA world. So an RNA world, for example, would have no protein, initially anyway. So RNA would have to also have a catalytic role. The ribosome, for example, most of the catalysis is actually carried out by RNA. You can take the protein away from a ribosome, and it will still make protein. And there are uh, ribozymes that we have discovered, self enzymes that are built into RNA. There are RNAs, for example, that can cut themselves. They can cleave themselves into two. They can splice out intervening sequences. So there's evidence that there were enzymatic activities that are compatible with an RNA world. So RNA viruses are relics, really, of what used to be. They are still evolutionarily competitive, which is why they are around. Uh, later in the course, we'll talk about a very interesting uh, virus called a viroid which are small RNA molecules, highly folded, shown here as an example on the right. And these are mainly pathogens of plants. There's one exception. There is a human pathogen we'll talk about. But they're interesting because they don't encode any protein. And they can get into a plant and reproduce, make more of themselves. There's no protein shell on it. And they can spread from plant to plant and cause disease in plants without encoding any protein. And so they're probably an early version of what existed in an RNA world before there were cells. And I think my view of evolution is that as cells arose, these self-replicating, say, RNAs entered cells and were selected to be able to multiply in a cell rather than outside. I think it was more efficient to replicate in the cell. But when we talk about evolution, we'll get into that a little more. So I can tell you what the reason or the function of RNA and DNA genomes, because RNA viruses are relics of what used to be around, and they're still competitive evolutionarily. However, uh, why, for what reason do we have linear, circular, segmented, double-stranded, single-stranded, different polarities, genomes? I can't tell you. I think the only thing we can say is that they have niches, ecological niches, where they all work and they survive. In my human view, all viruses should be plus-stranded RNA viruses because that makes the most sense. The virus has an RNA genome, which is highly mutable and adaptable, as you will see. 
It's plus RNA. As soon as it gets into the cell, protein is made. You don't have to do anything else. And you will see as we go through replication cycles that the other kinds of genomes, the other seven classes, have to do all kinds of gymnastics to get to mRNA. So I think in my human-centric view, plus-stranded RNA viruses should predominate. But they don't. All kinds of other configurations are out there, so obviously there are niches for each one of them. So I cannot tell you the function of many of these genome configurations. Now, I would suggest you memorize this, although you don't have to because when you have an exam, you can have a sheet of paper with stuff written on it, <laughs> and you can draw the Baltimore scheme. But it's so it takes up a lot of space, and it's really easy to remember. But every year, almost everyone has the Baltimore scheme on their cheat sheets. Not, not cheating, because I let you bring it in, but that's what everyone calls it, right? And uh, you, I, I'm always amazed at how artistic people get with these, and they have the Baltimore scheme sandwich in. But you should memorize it, because as I said, if you know this, you're going to be able to, to tell me from, if I give you a genome, you're going to know how mRNA is made and how it's copied to make uh, more genomes. So for here, for example, if uh, you start with a plus RNA, you know to make more plus, you have to go through a minus intermediate. So whatever a virus brings into a cell, it's not enough to make a lot of virus particles. You have to amplify the genome. And from this, you can figure out how that happens as well. Now, in this course, we're mostly going to talk about a, a handful of viruses. Uh, this is not a virus-type-centric course. We're going to have examples of each of these classes. And they're written on here. And I don't ask you to memorize them, but Sometimes you'll see a name of a virus, and if you're familiar with it, it'll make more sense to you. So for example, uh, the plus DNA viruses, parvoviruses is one of the families we'll talk about in a moment. Adenoviruses, herpes viruses, hepatitis B for the gapped, rheoviruses for the double-stranded. And this one you'll, you'll learn because these are, some of these are agents of gastroenteritis. Then we have influenza viruses as prototypes for the minus RNA viruses. For the plus RNA poliovirus, but of course the coronavirus that we're dealing with now globally is a plus-stranded RNA virus, so we'll talk about that as well. And finally, the retroviruses are exemplars of the viruses with plus RNA in them that go through a DNA intermediate. So I would try and be familiar with some of these. Here on this slide, just a handful of different viruses. Yes. Does the nature of the genome make any one virus more dangerous than others? So I would say that, so there are a lot of DNA viruses that are pathogens, but there are way more pathogens that are RNA viruses. So uh, RNA viruses dominate eukaryotic organisms. I think that's because they're more mutable and they can vary and occupy more niches. So I think having an RNA genome probably is better. And you get more, path when we look at the pathogens later in this course, you'll see most, most of them are RNA viruses. And so whenever a new virus emerges, it's typically an RNA virus. Let's look at the new emerging viruses of the past years. So we have the coronaviruses multiple times. We have Ebola virus, which is an RNA virus. We have Nipah and Hendra, which are RNA viruses. We had, of course, HIV, uh, which is an RNA virus. And um, so... Now, if you go back far enough, if you go back thousands of years, then you have smallpox emerging, which is a DNA virus. But yeah, you get the picture, I think. RNA viruses rule. All right, so what do genomes encode? Because I always, I keep saying that they don't have a translation system, but what do and don't they encode? So they have gene products and signals in them for protein synthesis. Uh, so every virus has to make an mRNA that can be translated. Um, and most viruses do not encode components of the translation system. In fact, when I started teaching this course, it was before we knew about giant viruses, I, I always used to say no virus encodes any part of the protein synthetic machinery. Now these giant viruses have been discovered with huge genomes, and it turns out they, can, they encode components of the translation system, like tRNAs and initiation factors and so forth but never the complete translation system. They encode proteins to replicate the viral genome. 
to assemble the genome into a capsid and package it. They include proteins that time the replication cycle. As you see, when we talk about the larger DNA viruses, the replication is broken up into phases to coordinate activities, and there are proteins that do that. A very interesting thing encoded in every viral genome is at least one protein to modulate host defenses. As I told you on day one, we have a great immune system. If viruses did not encode antagonists of that immune system, they'd all be wiped out because our immune system is amazing. But every virus has at least one protein that antagonizes either innate or adaptive immunity. And we'll talk about some of those. And those are encoded in the genomes. And then there are gene products that allow the viruses to get out of cells and spread to other cells. There is uh, one giant virus that was discovered a couple of years ago that I want to point out. Now, giant viruses are a thing unto themselves. They have a separate taxonomic classification because it turns out they have a number of genes that they share. And these are viruses with huge, huge genomes. I'll show you some examples in a minute. And now there are dozens and dozens of examples of these. They infect many different kinds of organisms. And uh, when they were first discovered, they were unusual because first, they had really big genomes and big particles. I showed you a picture of Mimi virus on the first day, much bigger than anything we had had. And second, they had, they encoded parts of the translation system, which we'd never seen before, except tRNA genes in some bacteriophages. So they're unusual. This one, Tupan virus, which is gorgeous. This is electron micrograph of the particles. And they're just beautiful. They're not blue, of course, but they look really unusual. They have a round capsid and some kind of a tail sticking out. We don't know what that's for. This virus genome encodes everything but the ribosome for protein synthesis. If you know anything about protein synthesis, you need aminoacyl tRNA synthetases to put the amino acids onto the tRNAs, right? You need tRNAs. And this virus genome encodes 70 of them. You need initiation and elongation proteins. This virus encodes them all. Genes for maturation of tRNAs and mRNAs. Everything but the ribosome. And in fact, I, I say only the ribosome is lacking because that's th this virus was discovered uh, so, and some of the authors were French, and that's the way they put it. Because it if you know how you would say this in French, it's different from English, right? Only the ribosome is lacking. So it's a little bit of a Frenchism. So it's true. This virus has everything, and that's remarkable. And why it does is a great question. Why does the viral genome have to encode everything but the ribosome when the cell is providing all of those components anyway, right? Lots of hypotheses. Maybe the virus needs to have more translation than the cell can provide, so it makes additional components. Maybe it has a specific amino acid triplet code usage. So we don't know the answers, but that's very interesting that it has so much encoded in it. So that is what is encoded in viral genomes, some of what's encoded. What's not in genomes, we don't have the complete protein synthesis apparatus in any viral genome. Even Tupan virus still is lacking the ribosome. We might find one, a virus, one day with it. It would still be a virus because there are many other things a cell provides that are needed and not in viral genomes. There are no genes encoding proteins involved in membrane biosynthesis. I used to have on this slide no genes, no metabolic genes. But now they've found photosynthesis genes. They've found complete photosynthesis systems in some ocean viruses so that they can make more energy in the cell for their reproduction, especially viruses that are in sunlit waters, that infect hosts of sunlit waters. There are no centromeres or telomeres. So you know our DNA uh, is organized, and we have structures called telomeres at the end. We have centromeres. Those are not typically found uh, in encoded in viral genomes, the proteins that make them up. But as I always like to say, uh, we probably haven't found these genes because every time we sequence a new giant virus genome, 90% of the genes are new. We don't recognize what they're encoding. They're proteins we've never seen before, and so someday we might find more and more and more. Of course, if a viral genome once at some point encodes everything, then it's no longer a virus. 
right? Because a virus needs to get into a cell. That's our definition of a virus. Something that would have genes encoding everything that needs to be done would be a cell. So I suspect that we'll get close, but never all the way there. So here are, are a couple of tables in a row now to show you the biggest and the smallest viral genomes, just to give you an idea of the size range. Largest known viral genomes. And the biggest ever discovered is Pandora virus Salinas, which is 2,473,000 bases of double-stranded DNA. That is freaking huge. I can't emphasize how big that is. Here is the Haemophilus influenzae genome. That's a bacterium, a free-living bacterium. Its genome is 1.8 million base pairs. It's smaller than this viral genome. Here on the bottom here is a bacterial genome. This bacterium needs to live inside another bacterium, so it can't do everything on its own, but it still can live in. It's 112,000 base pairs of DNA, so these viruses are huge. So in the middle column is the length, and in the right are the number of proteins. This Pandora virus encodes 2,500 proteins. And there's another Pandora virus, which is 1.9. To be fair, there are like six different Pandora viruses now that would take up most of this table. And I've left them out because they are actually all the biggest. But I want to show you some other viruses that are big. There's two pan virus that encodes everything of the protein synthesis apparatus but the ribosome. Uh, and then we have a virus called Bodosaltans. This is a virus that infects protists in the oceans. Uh, and then megavirus, mama virus, mimi virus. Okay, so this is the French again, right? <laughs> so they found mimi virus first, and mimi stands for microbe mimic. And then they thought they would be clever, and they found mama and moo moo. <laughs> and on and on, and you get to name your virus so they stick. But when you go to meetings, people make fun of the French for doing this, and they laugh because they, they think it's funny. And then all the way down here, cafeteria Rhone-Bergensis virus, another virus that infects uh, protists in the ocean, uh, 600,000. Now, to give you perspective, uh, we thought the biggest virus genome were the pox viruses which were like 300,000 base pairs. So this is a big jump. When we found Mimi virus, 1.1 million, people were like amazed. And the more you look, the more you find them. And many of these are just found by taking water samples and sequencing all the nucleic acids you can find, or even many people take the water and they put them on cultures of amoeba. A lot of these viruses infect amoeba, and they use amoeba as a readout, and you can isolate. I, I know a story of a a French virologist, uh, Jean-Michel Clavery, he told me he was in Australia at a meeting and he looked out the window and he saw a pond. He took his bottle of water and, and got some pond water and brought it back with him to France and they isolated, I think one of these Pandora viruses came from a muddy pond in Australia. So if you're willing to just look everywhere, you can find new ones. Now those DNA viruses, there are no RNA viruses on that biggest chart because the, the RNA viruses are so far behind in size that it will fit. But I wanted to show you the biggest RNA virus genomes that we know about. The biggest one so far is this 41.1 KB, 41,000 bases of, these are positive stranded RNA genomes, single stranded. And this is a virus of planaria. Um, they just ground it up and sequenced the genomes, and they found viral sequences in them. And then there's another one, 35.9 KB, which uh, is a virus of aplesia. It's a mollusk. If you do any neuroscience, you know this is commonly used in neuroscience research. And then there's a snake virus, ball python nidovirus 33.5. So the coronaviruses that we've talked about a little, the one that's circulating in China and other SARS and MERS, are about 29,000. Base pairs. We used to think bases. We used to think those were the biggest, but they're not the biggest anymore. Uh, these are, are bigger. And again, they're found accidentally by people just sequencing nucleic acids from different organisms. So there might be bigger ones out there, but they never get to a million base pairs. RNA cannot sustain a bigger size. 
the reasons are complicated, but the RNA polymerases that copy RNAs make a lot of mistakes and they never get corrected. So because of mutation rates, RNAs can't get very long. They have too many mutations in them. These uh, viruses, the ones that are the biggest RNA viruses, the coronaviruses, they encode an error correcting protein, which allows them to get that big. And most RNA viruses do not. That's why they're much smaller. I think the average size for an RNA virus genome is about 11,000 bases in length. What are the smallest known viral genomes? This is quite interesting. So the smallest would be a viroid, which is 120 nucleotides of RNA. That's it. It's naked. It doesn't encode any proteins. Yet, when that's introduced into a plant, it replicates. It, makes the plant, it can make the plant sick. We'll talk about these in, uh, at the end of the course. So that's the shortest. Then there are what we call satellite viruses. And these will only replicate in a cell infected with another virus, a rep what we call a replication competent virus. So they have small genomes. They don't encode any proteins. And then uh, the first genome that encodes a protein is hepatitis delta. This is a uh, small RNA that encodes one protein, 1,700 bases in length. It will only replicate in cells infected with hepatitis B virus. And people get infected with this. So if you have hep B, which about 350 million people globally have hepatitis B virus infections, some of them have also Delta virus coming along with it, and it seems to make the infection more severe. And then we get a little bit bigger. Circoviruses are single-stranded DNA viruses uh, with two proteins coded in the genomes. Anellos are also single-stranded DNA. Most of us have these viruses in us. The blood supply is full of these viruses. They don't seem to do anything. And every pint of blood that we have has these viruses in them, so we can't not use blood because they're present. We wouldn't have a blood supply. Gemini virus is a plant virus with four proteins. Hepatitis B is rather small, seven proteins. That's a DNA virus. These smallest ones are RNA viruses. Here we have some DNA viruses. And then at the bottom are some other uh, RNA viruses with rather small genomes. So the RNA viruses are typ typically small. But I'm amazed this one here, 120 bases, is remarkable. But I think it's a relic of uh, an RNA world. All right, our next question is what information may be encoded in a viral genome? Gene products that catalyze membrane biosynthesis gene products that catalyze energy production, complete protein synthesis systems, centromeres or telomeres, enzymes to replicate the viral genome. OK, how did we do? Most of you got the last one there, but not a huge percentage. Enzymes to replicate the viral genome. Of all these things, that's the only thing that's correct. Gene products that catalyze membrane biosynthesis. No, it's on one of the slides. Energy production. I guess that's right, right? <laughs> yeah, so 15% so of you got that, and that makes up the rest from the 77. Yeah, I told you that there's some photosynthetic genes. You're right, I have to change this next year. OK, so those of you who got B are correct. C is not right. Complete protein synthesis systems. They have everything but the ribosome, right? So that's part of it. No centromeres or telomeres. So let's talk about some viral DNA genomes and some examples. Uh, DNA viruses predominate in bacteria. They don't predominate in us, as you will see. There are very few RNA viruses of bacteria. There are reasons for that, and when we talk about evolution, we'll talk about it. Many DNA viruses, of course, emulate the host because we, the host of all viruses has DNA. Uh, but m almost all viral genomes are not like cell chromosomes. Our cell chromosomes in us are chromatinized. They're wrapped in histones and wrapped around them uh, in a very specific way. And most viral genomes in the particle are not like that. And there are many different things that happen in DNA synthesis that don't happen in the cell. And you will see these when we talk about that specifically. Here are some examples of double-stranded DNA genomes. First, again, the double-stranded DNA is very simple because it can be transcribed to make mRNA, which would then be made into proteins, translated into proteins. Of course, you have to replicate the DNA always to make more DNA to put in these particles. And that happens using at least one protein encoded by the virus. They're the smallest viruses, as you will see, don't encode much of the DNA synthesis apparatus, but they have one protein 
that is used to hijack the host. And here I have the DNA genomes, the double-stranded DNA genomes divided into two parts. We have uh, DNA genomes that are copied by host DNA polymerases. As you know, we have DNA polymerases that replicate our genes. And the smallest viral genomes do not have enough coding capacity to encode a DNA polymerase, so they are copied by host DNA polymerase. As an example of the polyomaviruses, which are 5,000 bases of double-stranded circular DNA, which we will talk about quite a bit in this course, they don't encode a polymerase, but they do encode a protein that hijacks the cell polymerase, as you'll see. The larger double-stranded DNA genomes can encode DNA polymerases. Those encode, include adenoviruses, and you can see the size differences here. Uh, herpes viruses and pox viruses. These are obviously not drawn to scale, but you look at the size and you can see they get bigger and bigger. These used to be what we thought were the biggest viruses, the pox viruses, but the, the giant viruses are way bigger now. So double-stranded that are either copied by the host polymerase or not. Some examples of viruses with double-stranded DNA genomes, adenoviruses, these cause a range of human infections, respiratory, gastrointestinal infections, herpes viruses, which infect everyone pretty much uh, on the planet, and we will talk about those in some detail. Then we have papillomaviruses and polyomaviruses. Papillomaviruses cause warts. There are hundreds of, over 150 different kinds of papilloma. If you ever had a wart on your hand or your feet, it's caused by these viruses. If you're an athlete and you walk around in the locker room, you will get pap papillomaviruses on the bottom of your feet because they're shed as your skin is shed. That's how they spread. And you will pick them up on the cracks in the bottom of your feet and you'll get warts on the bottom of your feet. Some of them are sexually transmitted and they cause cancers, and we will talk about that. Polyomavirus is another virus that most of us are infected with, apparently of no consequence unless you're immunosuppressed. And finally, the pox viruses, uh, rather large DNA viruses. The agent of smallpox is among them, and there are many others as well. People are using these for gene therapy, and we'll talk about that later. I put on here a pithovirus, which is the biggest physically-sized particle we know of, pithovirus sibiricum. This came out of a ice core in Siberia. It's 35,000 years old. It's not, it doesn't have the biggest genome, though, so it wasn't even on that table. But it's five times bigger than pox viruses. I tried to approximate that here so that you can see how this dwarfs uh, everything else. All right, then we have a, another class, a Baltimore class, with gapped double-stranded DNA. Why it has a gap, you will find out when we talk about reverse transcription, but the way the genome looks like, it's actually a circle. It's partially double-stranded. As you can see here, it has a gap where there's only one single strand, the minus strand. It also has a protein attached to one end of the DNA and a piece of RNA on the other. And as I said, we'll find out how this happens, but that cannot be transcribed into mRNA. It has to be made double-stranded. You have to remove the protein, remove the RNA, repair it. That appears to happen by the host cell, and then that DNA can be transcribed to make mRNA. And that, that cycle is shown here. The gap DNA is repaired. It then can be transcribed into mRNA, which can be made into proteins. Now, these viruses are unusual. They also encode a reverse transcriptase, an enzyme that takes RNA and makes a DNA copy of it. And so what happens here is the DNA is transcribed. Proteins are made. One of the proteins is a reverse transcriptase, an enzyme that copies some of the mRNAs and makes a DNA copy. And it's during reverse transcription that the gapping in, in these protein and the RNA are attached to the genome. Hepatitis B virus is an example of this. This is a serious human pathogen. It is spread by sex and blood, blood transfusions, sexually transmitted. And the problem with it, well, there are 350 million people infected, and that long-term infection can give you liver cancer. And so we are trying to prevent this. We do have a vaccine. We do have some antiviral approaches. All right, single-stranded DNA genomes, another Baltimore class. Uh, these viruses can package either the minus or the plus strand. And again, that can't be transcribed. It has to be made double-stranded, the host cell. When a single-strand DNA comes into the nucleus, the host cell makes it, repairs it, makes it double-stranded. And that can be then transcribed to make proteins that will go on to make new virus particles. 
We'll talk about how all of these replicate in individually later on. There are two examples on this slide. One is a virus with a circular single-stranded DNA genome, pretty small. These are the Circoviridae, including TT virus, which, again, infects most of us with no apparent consequence. On the right are parvoviruses, single-stranded linear genomes with an unusual structure shown here. There is a human parvovirus called B19, which causes fifth disease. This is the fifth among the childhood rash diseases. Let's see if I can knock them off. Measles, chickenpox, mumps, rubella, and fifth disease would be this one. And measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, we have vaccines that prevent all of them. We don't have one for this. But if you have a dog or a cat, you know that there are canine and feline parvoviruses that can kill your pets, so we have vaccines to prevent them. One year when I was teaching this course, Oprah Winfrey, I, I don't watch the program, but someone told me her, her dogs died of parvovirus infection. Why? Because she didn't vaccinate them. If she had, they would have been okay. So you should vaccinate your pets. All right, a question, our next question. Which DNA genome on entry into the cell can be immediately copied into mRNA? Double-stranded DNA, gap double-stranded DNA, circular, single-stranded, linear, single-stranded, all of the above. Okay, how did we do? Most of you got double-stranded DNA, which is right. Only double-stranded DNA can be transcribed, nothing else. Gap, no, circular, no, linear, no. Okay, RNA genomes, as I said, RNA viruses dominate eukaryotic virosphere. Virosphere is all the virus genomes that we know of. Very rare in bacteria. Key point here, cells don't have RNA polymerases. They can't copy RNA genomes. RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, RDRP, are unique to viruses. So all RNA virus genomes, except for those small ones that encode nothing, of course, they encode RDRP. And these polymerases make, make mRNA and they replicate the genome to make more of them. So this is a major difference between RNA viruses and DNA viruses. Let's go through some of the classes. Double-stranded RNA viruses, as I said, the double-stranded RNA genome cannot be translated. Even though it has a plus mRNA in it, it has to be copied into mRNA, which can then go on to be translated or replicated to make new genomes. An example is a virus called rotavirus, which is a cause of human gastroenteritis. And these viruses have segmented genomes, they're in pieces. The virus particle has anywhere from one to 12 segments, depending on the kind of rheovirus, and they're all packaged into the virus. You need all of them to initiate an infection, but they're all in one virus particle. Single-stranded plus sense RNA. The, the strategy that makes the most sense to me, the viral genome is plus stranded. It gets in the cell, it's immediately translated into protein. You don't have to replicate it initially. The viral proteins then can go on to build capsids. They can also go on to one of those proteins. It has to be the RNA polymerase, which will copy the plus through a minus intermediate to make more genomes. We have lots and lots of viruses with plus sense RNA. Coronaviruses there that we've been talking about. Flaviviruses, yellow fever virus, Zika virus, West Nile virus. Picornaviruses, poliovirus, rhinovirus, and Toga viruses, a lot of the encephalitis viruses that we hear about, mosquito-borne encephalitis viruses or toga viruses. You can see the genomes have different lengths and they have different configurations. Some of them are polyadenylated and capped. The corner is unusual. They have a protein. And we will touch on some of these as we go through the individual viruses. Some examples. The corner, I've already told you this, polio and rhino. The, the calici viruses are also plus strand, which I haven't mentioned much, although I did talk about whales getting infected with them. These also cause human gastroenteritis, and these are mostly responsible for the cruise ships coming back when uh, they have an outbreak on them. We'll talk about that later. Our coronaviruses, the three epidemic strains, SARS, MERS, and their new one, and then our flaviviruses and the togaviruses, for example, uh, equine encephalitis virus, and rubella virus, one of the childhood rash viruses, is a toga virus. Plus, RNA viruses can also have a DNA intermediate. That's a separate Baltimore class. These are 
plus sense with DNA. These are the retroviridae. There's one family, and that family has two human pathogens, HIV, of course, and they're one and two, types one and two. We will dedicate a lecture to HIV and AIDS later on, and human T lymphotropic virus, another cancer-causing virus. And these viruses are unusual because the plus RNA in the particle is not translated when it gets into the cell. It is copied into a DNA copy, which then integrates into the host chromosome. And there it is transcribed into mRNA, which goes on to make proteins, and eventually some of those RNAs are packaged into new virus particles. We will cover this replication cycle in great detail, but again, the genome is a plus RNA, but it is not mRNA because it's not translated uh, when it gets into the cell. We also have RNA viruses with, of minus polarity, so that minus RNA, when it enters the cell, it cannot be translated. So the only way to make proteins is to make mRNA from it, but the, the cell cannot do that. Cells have no way to make mRNA from a minus RNA. So the virus particle has to contain RNA polymerase enzyme in the particle. So that's different from the plus strand RNA viruses because the plus strand can go into a cell and be translated. So there need not be an enzyme in the particle of a plus strand RNA virus. But for these viruses, uh, you need to have the enzyme in the particle. And so some of these are segmented. Some of these, like influenza viruses, some of them are in single molecules, like measles virus and rabies virus. And examples of these viruses include measles and mumps, rabies, the filoviruses, Ebola and Marburg virus, which are quite large compared to these other. These are roughly drawn to scale to one another, of course, influenza viruses and the, uh, the Lassa virus. And I have to tell you, this, this book, Fever, was written in the 70s about the first outbreak of Lassa in Africa. Part of it takes place at Columbia. It's very interesting. But I read this. I had just graduated college. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And I read this book, and I decided I wanted to be a virologist. So I have it up here in, in recognition of that. When you have a segmented genome in pieces, you can do something that no virus can do. You can reassort. You can have two influenza viruses that are genetically diverse infecting a cell, and the viruses that come out have mixed the genomes from the two input particles. We call that reassortment. You can see red and blue genomes here, and then we have the parental viruses, and here is one with a red segment from one virus and the rest from the others. That's very special, and it allows viruses to undergo variation that is above the normal mutation rates, and we will talk about this. There are ambisense genomes, like the arena viruses, the Lassa virus that I liked so much. And here, the RNA has both plus and minus components. So the green part here is plus, and the minus is negative. And these viruses have a polymerase in the particle in order to copy this into an mRNA when it gets into the cell. So that's what mBSense means. It has both. Now, RNAs I've been drawing for you as lines, but actually in virus particles, they are not just simple lines. They have complex structures. They have secondary structures shown here caused by base pairing among complementary regions. There are local base pairings. There are long-term interactions. So for the red can base pair here. And we know that if we solve the structures of these RNAs, we get things like this shown in panel D, where they are very distinct from the linear diagrams we often grow, uh, draw. So I want you to just keep in mind that I do it from simplicity, but RNAs are actually all folded up inside the virus and inside the cell. And we have one last quiz here. Which statement about viral RNA genomes is right? Plus may be translated to make protein. Double strand can be directly translated to make protein. Plus RNA virus replication cycles do not require a minus strand intermediate. RNA genomes can be copied by host cell RNA dependent RNA polymerases, all of the above. All right, let's see how we did. Most of you got A. Plus RNA genomes may be translated to make viral protein. Maybe is correct. 
Uh, some of you said double stranded can be translated directly. They can't. The plus strand cannot be accessed. It has to be made into an mRNA. The plus RNA virus replication cycles do not require a minus strand intermediate. You do. You need to make minus to get more plus strands. There are no host cell RNA polymerases, so that's uh, not true. The development of the plaque assay allowed us to do genetics with animal viruses to manipulate their genomes. We could pick a plaque and characterize it. But today, uh, we engineer mutations into genomes using DNA copies of all viruses. This includes DNA and RNA viruses. We make a DNA copy. We propagate the, the plasmids in bacteria. We can purify them and make all sorts of deletions, additions, or changes. And maybe most importantly, we can make viral vectors to do therapeutic applications, which we'll talk about in the last lecture of this course. The process of putting DNA into a cell, viral DNA to get virus out is called transfection, first done with bacteriophage lambda. The word comes from transformation infection. You transform DNA into a cell and you start an infection. We can do this with either DNA or RNA molecules, put them in cells and out come viruses. The way this is done differs according to the virus. Here's an example for a very simple one, plus-stranded RNA virus, poliovirus, where the RNA itself is infectious, if you just put that into cells. You can make a DNA copy of it and put that into cells. It will also give rise to virus, and you can modify the DNA as you wish. Someone has, for example, modified it. This virus causes paralysis, but you can modify it genetically so it doesn't cause paralysis, and they're using it to cure glioblastomas, injecting it directly into the tumor. And so that's what you can do with DNA copies of genomes. You can manipulate viruses to be beneficial for us. Here's how you would do it for influenza virus. There are eight different RNAs of influenza virus. You, you make a plasmid encoding each of the RNAs, and this plasmid has two promoters, one that drives the production of mRNA, so you get proteins. The other drives the production of viral RNAs, the minus strand to get incorporated into virus particles. So you take eight plasmids, you put them all in cells together, and out come influenza viruses. Now, I want to tell you a story very briefly about how this was used, the 1918 pandemic, the global epidemic of influenza was horrible. Millions and millions of people died. But we didn't have the virus. We didn't isolate influenza virus until 1933. So we weren't able to work with this pandemic 1918 strain. In 2005, a number of investigators isolated RNA from formalin-fixed sections. So a lot of the people who died were in the army, the army took bits of their lungs out, froze them away. In 2005, someone went in, extracted the RNA from it, and determined the viral sequence from the RNA. They, and another group also went up to Alaska, and they went in graves that had been frozen all year round, and they dug up one from a person who had died of 1918 influenza. They took a biopsy of the lung, they extracted the RNA, and they did the sequence. So between these two studies, they got the complete sequence of all eight segments. They put them in plasmids, and they recovered the virus. So we can now work with it. And so this was this is a terrible influenza. It killed many people. So we want to know why it was particularly virulent. We have an ability to do this and do anything we want to a viral genome. And in fact, you don't even have to clone the genome in a plasmid anymore. Here's an example of horsepox an extinct virus for which we had the sequence, 200,000 plus bases. A group in Canada chemically synthesized that, 10 overlapping DNAs. You can have these synthesized, it cost them about $150,000. They put these DNAs into cells and out came horsepox virus. A virus that was extinct, the moral is a virus is never eradicated as long as you have the sequence. Now this experiment got some people scared. Here's an article in phys.org, scientists bring back extinct horsepox, raising important biosecurity questions. And so this is all about synthetic virology and biosecurity. You can make experiments, you can do experiments that you weren't able to do before with a virus. You can change its properties. You weren't able to do that. So as a consequence, the US government has formed this advisory board for biosecurity to regulate these experiments. 
If you write a proposal to modify a dangerous virus, they will review it and make sure it's worth doing and that you do it under the proper containment so the virus won't get out and cause harm. All right, next time we're going to start looking at how viruses are built by looking at the structures of different kinds.